tutors, mentors, and the city with your host.com. The City Tutors presents Tutors, Mentors, and the City with your host.com. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening. Uh, I am your host, Kevin.com Brown, and welcome to Tutors, Mentors in the City, brought to you by the City Tutors Organization. I want to give a special shout out to our executive director, Mr. Gary Rifkin, our chief program success manager, Mr. Michael Chen, and all of the wonderful board members and partners and sponsors and volunteers who work with the City Tutors program. So I'm just going to jump right in. Please join me in welcoming our guest for this episode, Mr. Gene McCarthy. Give it up for Gene, everybody. Yay! <laughs> so how are you, Gene? Hey, Kevin. I'm, I'm terrific. How are you? It's great to see you. Great to see you, too. So we're meeting for the first time. And uh, what I do is I don't prepare for my interviews. OK, now, what do I mean by that? What I mean is, since I'm introducing people to uh, our beautiful participants who they are probably unfamiliar with, I want to take the journey with them and learn about you the same time everybody else does, right? So I don't read, I don't read any, I don't go to your Facebook page, I don't read any bios on you. I'm going to learn, we're going to learn everything about you together right now. Okay. So, so the 27 pages of notes I prepared for this, I should just discard, right? Oh yeah. Throw that out. Throw <laughs> that out. <'cause> it's, <laughs> it, it's not going to matter at all. And one of my mentors, I say this facetiously, one of my mentors is Tracy Morgan. If you're familiar with Tracy Morgan's career, he's never prepared for anything and he's made a great career out of it. Right. So I try to follow in his footsteps on that and only that. <laughs> so that being said, Tell us about yourself. Who are you? What do you, who are you right now? So, uh, you know, my name, I'm Gene yep. McCarthy, but let me, I'm, a, I'm a, a kid from the Bronx. So let me be an Irish storyteller for you and, and tell you my journey. Um, I was born in Manhattan, grew up in the Bronx and uh, oldest of five kids and um, lived in a small apartment, one bathroom, seven people. You get the story, not unfamiliar to many people who grew up in New York. And, uh, but I had a transformational moment when I was 13 years old. I uh, saw a cover of Sports Illustrated and um, there were a, a very vivid photograph on the cover of two guys running. So um, I was compelled by the picture an image. I read the article several times and I realized there was this thing out there about breaking the four minute mile. So the four minute mile was only a few years earlier, 17 years earlier than I read that article. It was the first time it was ever broken. And there were times when doctors would say, it's impossible your heart would explode. And I'm like, yeah, that's for me. I want my heart to explode. So I'll fast forward eight years after seeing that article. I graduated from Fordham University um, in the Bronx, Rose Hill campus. And um, I was an All-American and I had run the mile in four minutes and three seconds. So I got ever so close to that dream of breaking the four minute mile. Um, I, I did something that's unusual in today's world. I actually wrote a letter. That's where you take a piece of paper and a pen and you actually write. Um, and I wrote a letter to one of the guys on the cover of the magazine. And uh, he read my letter and thought it was interesting. He invited me to move to Florida where he was still competing and he would help me with my dream. So the point I'm getting at is I'm a kid from the Bronx. I saw a cover of a magazine. I got a free education because of it. There's no way in an immigrant family that we could ever afford to go to college. I was the first person in my family to go to college. Um, I got to see the world with my travels as an athlete. And then eventually I had a 40 year career with um, all of these companies in that industry, including Nike, Reebok, Under Armour. I was the president of ASICS. I was the president of Timberland. And um, so you could say my avocation and my vocation are one and the same, but if it weren't for that magazine and believing in a dream, I don't know that I'd be talking to you right now, Kevin.com Brown. Wow. Wow. How do you become the president of those companies? What, what kind of qualifications is, is, was it the Fordham degree? Was it the four minute mile? Which one qualifies you to make, to be the president of com companies like that? You know, I, I think first of all, a career like anything, and you know, this, you know, from your illustrious background, a career is a journey and it starts somewhere and then it compounds upon itself. 
But um, I think, yes, of course, I had a degree in marketing. I did not have a master's degree. That's not to poo-poo master's degrees, but I didn't. I had I had a, another hard knocks education of going through life and then going through working for these companies at all levels. Everybody always aspires to be a president or a CEO. Well, I started at the very bottom. You know, there was one time I one of my first jobs uh, when I was in the Bronx, I was at 10 years old, I was delivering prescription drugs for the local pharmacy, you know, to shut-ins. And, um, and then I delivered dry cleaning in Manhattan. And then I worked at Baskin Robbins. And um, I even was a Pitney Bowes postage meter salesman. And all of those things teach you a lot about perseverance. They teach you a lot about s- different skills, but it also teaches you sometimes about what you're not good at. And I was, I was an avid listener to what was going on inside my head. But um, I think if there's one thing that I learned, um, it's because I'm, I'm a listener and I, I prefer to listen than to speak, although it's hard to believe that right now as I'm rambling on. And um, I listened and I observed. My, my son said to me the same thing um, not too long ago. He said, so dad, like, what is it? What do you have to do as a CEO? And Kevin, I, I told him instinctively, there's only four things you have to do. You have to look you have to listen, you have to think, and then you have to decide. Now that may sound simple. There's a book under each one of those four things, but that's simply it. So anybody, and I mean anybody, could go to where I was privileged to go at the, at the height of a company. Um, but those four principles, way beyond education, they matter. Look, we're, we're New Yorkers, right? I know who friend or foe is before the subway door closes. I also know who friend or foe is before the boardroom door closes or the conference room door closes too. So it's some of these just basic instincts that we're privileged to have here in New York as a matter of survival served me really well throughout my career. Wow, beautiful, beautiful answers. Uh, you're a product of public school? No, nah, I'm a, <clears throat> I have 16 years of Catholic education, which I guess makes okay. me a model child. I went to uh, an all boys Catholic high school right by Yankee Stadium called All Hollows. I know that school. Yes. My, my neighbor growing up, uh, uh, a little Spanish kid, he went to all hollows. There you go. There was a Irish Christian brother. High schools were started um, way back in like 1906. And there was one in Newark, New Jersey, one in uh, uh, Midtown called uh, Power Memorial, where a guy named Lou Alcinder went to school. His later, Kareem Abdul-Jabbar. And then there was Rice High School. And then there was All Hollows. All Hollows, sadly, is the only one that's still standing. Right. Then I went. To, then I got over fifty scholarship offers when I was in high school. I was the fastest uh, miler in New York City in the five boroughs, and I got fifty scholarship offers. And what do I do? I pick a college eight miles from my house, Fordham University, <laughs> another Catholic school, the Jesuits. So, uh, but I also had um, eight years with this uh, Sisters of Charity at Our Lady of Angels over by the reservoir in the Kingsbridge section of the Bronx. So uh, I'm tried and true Bronx educated, uh, both in the classroom and on the street. Wow, okay, okay. Well, I'm, I'm very familiar with, with everything you're mentioning being born and raised in the Bronx myself. Uh, okay, so you, you write a letter after you graduate from college, you write a letter to this guy who was on the cover of the magazine. Mm-hmm. And you, went, you said you went to Florida? Yes. Yeah, so I'll tell you about this guy. His name was Marty LaCorey. I know that name. I remember watching him in like the Olympics or something. Or the, that's the correct. World. Yeah. 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 He was okay. not only in the Olympics, but he was also a, an announcer. So he did a lot of wide world of sports and all that. Yeah. And he actually went to a Irish Christian brother high school called New, uh, Essex Catholic in Newark, New Jersey. So one of the brothers at Ohalo's got me his address. I wrote him a letter and I said, I always want, I admired you. And I was kind of a a love letter of sorts. And he had moved to Florida, not only for the training uh, environment, because it was University of Florida, the weather was great, all of those things. But he started a a company at the time, there's an athletic shoe chain called Athletic Attic, which some people, maybe not on this podcast would remember because you, you have to be my age or in that zone. But eventually those stores were gobbled up and became foot action. So he was on the ground floor starting that chain. So I had a part-time job in a running store, you know, on the floor selling shoes to avid runners. And then I got to train with some of the world's greatest. And you know what I learned, Kevin, and this is another thing, a lesson I hope I can share, particularly with our listeners, is that 
I don't think the workouts were anything special. I don't think it's anything he couldn't have written down and sent to me and told me do this workout. I learned everything from him from the neck up. It was all attitude. It was approach. It was how do you position yourself? How do you, where's your poise? You know, um, how do you, you know, have a, a shrewd attitude towards competition while still being a gentleman? And all of those things not only helped me succeed and eventually break the four minute mile, but those are the same principles I use throughout my 40 year career working, you know, with Nike. I was at Nike for 21 years, which is a long time. So uh, all of those things you learn when you're young definitely are principles that you carry through uh, your career forward. So I, the point here is I know you know this, you never forget where you came from. Absolutely. Absolutely. So uh, breaking the four minute mile was world class, world class, right? When you know, people started breaking it, 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 it led to now there was a small uh, elite group of athletes who who started breaking the four minute mile at a, in a certain time frame, right? Yeah, I can't put myself in that category because by that time, it wasn't a common occurrence. It was still very considered very special. And right. while, you know, a lot of people over time haven't really done have done that, um, the times have gotten a lot faster. So my time, you know, would never stand up the test of time. Listen, I was lucky enough to be just good enough. I was never great like Marty LaCorey nor did I ever aspire to be. I just aspired to achieving a dream. And uh, that was the, my goal. So, you know, some people measure um, their lives with an hourglass. I measured, you know, that part of my life with a stopwatch. And um, it was more about accomplishing something than it was to have the athletic achievement. Okay, so detail. Now, you, you, you're a Bronx kid. You go to Florida. What, he, he, he had a big house and he put you up. You slept in the, in the garage. What was that set up like? So I get picked up by a guy at the airport and it was culture shock. I walked down the steps of the plane. I'm like, where's the jetway? There's no jetway, like at LaGuardia or Kennedy. And, um, and there was no carousel because there was no terminal. There was just this big metal thing with your luggage on it with an umbrella over it. So culture shock. A guy picked me up in a car that was older than my dad and drove me to a house. I'll never forget this. And I was, I was totally terrified. I drove to this house and I never lived in a house. I grew up in an apartment building. And uh, we go to this house and there's the tall grass in the backyard and there's a guy there with no shirt on and he's whacking it with uh, a golf club. And I knew this guy wasn't practicing his golf swing, but uh, I went up and introduced myself to him. And this is my new housemate. His name was Steve Foster. He came from Ohio, the same dreams that I had. And he was in the backyard because he was threatened with eviction because he never cut the, the grass in the backyard. So within minutes of meeting him, I too was standing in there in a pair of shorts with another golf club and cutting the grass. So that's a little different from the Bronx. Not too much grass going on in the Bronx, if you know what I mean, except maybe Van Cortland Park. So wait, you were cutting the grass with golf clubs? Yeah. You, you oh, know, that's, that's practicing your swing. That's practicing your swing. I'm telling you. I, we, I Listen, I still don't have a good golf swing, probably because <laughs> of that moment. So it was traumatizing. But that's no, it wasn't the big house. And like athletes, you know, in the last 10 years, have all have, not all, but many have some of these gracious uh, training environments. And it was just, I had to work in a sporting goods store. I had to get up every day and run five miles in the morning and then work all day, then run again 10 miles in the afternoon. So, you know, there's nothing glamorous about it, but I was willing to do that because I needed to redeem myself. Um, you know, I needed to have that dream come true or at least give it, you know, the good old college try, which maybe I didn't give at Fordham the good old college try. Okay, so, so you're in Florida for how long? So I got there in 1978. Uh, the Olympic trials were coming up in 1980. So that was my goal. I was going to give it two years. And uh, of course, uh, in March, before the Olympics in 1980, Jimmy Carter decided there would be no Olympics because they were in Moscow, at least Olympics for the US, and we boycotted because of Russia's occupation of Afghanistan. Um, so it became a labor of love at that point. And uh, I, um, I ran in the pen relays uh, in 1980 and I ran four minutes and one second. So I missed by one second. And I stutter stepped on the back, on the, the back stretch. And I know that cost me my four minute mile. But I was invited down to Kingston, Jamaica, and uh, I got to run in a race because Marty LaCorey became injured. The meat promoter was a legend to me. His name is John Carlos, one of the famous Olympians who, it would, you know, who that's correct with his glove and a, a totally moving and chilling moment to this day for me. And here he was the meat promoter for this race. There were 60,000 people there. 
And somehow I got third place behind the world record holder and the, and the former world record holder. And I just nudged under four minutes at 359.6. So that was it. Three. <laughs> but the Breaking. lesson learned, the lesson learned, Kevin, was a few weeks later, they still had the Olympic trials, even though there would nobody be going to the games. I made the semifinals and then I took my track shoes off and um, I walked around the track barefoot and I had an epiphany and Marty LaCorey looked at me and his eyes spoke more than he said, but he goes, enough is enough. Now, I don't know if you can see behind me over my shoulder, but those track spikes are still in that case today and they've been laced ever since 1980. I never put them back on and I just moved on and walked away. Wow. Wow. So what was that moment? What, did, what was that moment about? I think you get to a moment where you have to realize a, a bunch of things. First of all, how good can you be? I, I mean, I, you know, r- running like any sport is a lot of mind over matter. And I think my mind got me across that threshold that I always wanted to break. But I'm 5'7", and at the time I was 125 pounds. I'm 135 pounds now. Um, and uh, I, you just realize you have limitations. The second thing was I, I had just turned 24, and it was time to start to realize that there's, you know, w- work has to step in and play has to stop. So uh, that's when I decided, let me just leave it where it is. And one of the hard parts is any athlete has a hard time walking away, no matter what level of your success or what level of, you know, um, your accomplishment. And um, I I just felt like walking away while the going was was good, you know, And, and that was important to me. So the decision to do it. Uh, is far more important to me than the actual four minute mile itself. Right. Uh, you, br- you break the four minute mile, you honor that dream that you had and you still come in third place. Isn't that incredible about the world of sports and, and human capabilities? That's, that's incredible. <laughs> and I think that's the lesson is that if you really believe in something, I, I really think this is true. You can accomplish way beyond, you know, um, your talents. And so that was a rare moment. I was by no means a world-class athlete. I was a good national class athlete. And uh, that's good enough for me. Well, the, the, the race you had mentioned leading to that, where you, you did four minutes and one second or 4.1, you said, mm-hmm. you didn't say whether you won that race. Did you win no. that race? No, I got fifth in that race. And I will tell you this, it was, it was at the Penn Relays. And um, as I crossed the finish line, there's always thousands of people there every year at the Penn Relays, thousands, like 40,000. And um, like a Where's Waldo moment, when I crossed the finish line, I saw my dad amidst the crowd and he has a stopwatch around his neck. And, I, and we were distant apart. And I remember having that laser vision looking at him in the eye and he just shook his head. And that's when I realized I didn't break it. But I also realized, too, that's what I wanted to do was I wanted to deliver this as a gift to my father. Right, right, right. And in, in my journey, you know, you, you are, you are um, giving me chills. In my journey, most of the things that I, that I end up accomplishing, I didn't plan to, right? I remember growing up in the Bronx, I was bullied as a kid, bullied all the time. And uh, I, I went to take karate under my brother, who was a who was a fifth degree black belt. And but I didn't go to take karate. I went to learn to kick. That's what I wanted to learn to do. So I, I went to learn to kick and I ended up getting a black belt in martial arts and karate. And then for City College, I just went to get my bachelor's degree to honor a promise to my mom. Now I'm in now I'm going for my master's. I'm, I'm going to go for my Ph.D. I'm going to. So I'm I'm like you. I have <laughs> I set my bar. And my bar, you know, your bar is all that mattered to you. You wanted the four minute, you wanted to break that four minute mile. You weren't, you didn't want to get on the cover of a Wheaties box. (laughs) You know, you didn't want to do all that stuff. And then once you hit your goal, you knew. And that, that must, must have been a, a very interesting moment. But what, like you said, you were, you were scared getting out the plane, kid from the Bronx. There was no, there was no, you know, um, no run, walkway from the plane. There was no luggage carousel. Now what? Aren't you scared once you take those cleats off of now what? I think that was more scary than, you know, getting off that plane in the hot, humid air in Gainesville, Florida. 
and being in very completely, you know, um, unknown territory on many levels. And listen, I remember when we were, we would warm up, like when you grew up in the Bronx, you'd warm up on the track at, at McCombs Dam Park or Van Cortland Park. And um, in Florida, they, we used to warm up by jogging on a little trail around what's called Lake Alice. Now, I didn't do much research about Florida, but I did know one thing that they, I read that in any uh, thing larger than a puddle is bound to have an alligator in it. So I was like frightened that we were jogging around this lake. Well, guess what? There were no alligators in that lake. Mm-hmm. You know why? Because they were all sunbathing within feet of where we were running. And then I was just coached to learn that only during mating season did they get angry. So there was a whole bunch of things to get used to. But to your point, I think the scariest thing wasn't putting those shoes on when I was a freshman at All Hollows. The scariest thing was taking them off in Florida years later because now I had to put on a different kind of shoes and I didn't know which kind of shoes would fit and what, what they would look like. So I went and got a big boy job selling postage meters and copiers. Uh, and I drove around Gainesville, Florida in an unair conditioned 68 Volkswagen bug, knocking on doors and trying to get office managers to you know, switch from licking stamps to using a Pitney Bowes postage meter. I hated every last second of it, but I think there in the beauty, there's beauty in, in doing something that you don't like, you know, it'll, it'll give you the, you know, the energy to find out what you do like. So I, um, I got a phone call from this guy at Nike. I, would, I had been a Nike sponsored athlete during my career. And he called me and says, you know, we're starting a program in Florida. And do you know anybody that has a marketing background that has any interest in running or sports that might want to work for us? And I go, yeah, me. And, uh, Lo and behold, uh, weeks later, I got a, a plane ticket. I flew out to Portland, Oregon. Uh, I interviewed. Um, well, actually, I didn't interview. The woman never showed up for the interview. We just went to dinner that night. And at dinner, we just talked about pleasantries. And then I got hired. So that was life forming, life uh, transforming to be uh, on the ground floor. Well, 1982 is when I joined Nike and I stayed there for 21 years. The last four of my years were probably the most prolific because I was part of a team that um, put together um, was the business of Michael Jordan, not just the shoes of Michael Jordan. Michael Jordan product was Air Jordans were always a part of a collection, but it was never a P&L business. So that was probably one of the most pivotal parts of my career that launched me into the other companies I worked for. Okay. Okay. So now you're at, you're at Nike, you, you, you move up the ladder to how, how that, that was the 21 year journey. How, how long did it take you to get to the top? So I I never got really to the top at Nike. I think that's reserved for companies later in my career. Um, I started driving around the state of Florida, you know, uh, doing clinics on, on running shoes. And then, um, when I, uh, I eventually became uh, the head of sales for the East Coast for Nike. And then uh, I was the director of sales for the Jordan brand. So that, that's where I cut my chops. But I also had a very visible role because uh, the Jordan brand was very stringent at the time. I'll use that word. We were very deliberate in making sure that we used the oldest trick in the book, which was um, there's a lot of demand out there. So short supply. So you create anxiety and frenzy. That's why kids to this day are still lining up for the Jordans, right? So, uh, and that made me attractive, I guess, to other companies. But I also wanted to know if it was me or if it was Nike. It was I good or was it just because I worked for this phenomenal, gigantic enterprise? And uh, then I went to the enemy, Reebok. And um, Nike was very happy for me with my career advancement. They gave me a going away present of uh, a day in federal court. So uh, anyway, I had to sit home for a whole year before I could join Reebok with pay, by the way. Wow. Okay. Okay. So let me unpack some of that. I I do recall uh, Michael Jordan, phenomenal, right? He was the young hotshot, uh, you know, coming up doing his thing. He changed he changed the whole scope of the game. When you mentioned uh, doing, you you mentioned and I, I'm, uh, the word is escaping me, but about running shoes. You did something about running shoes. Was running the the technology of running shoes was being developed at that time. Is that right? Yeah. So when I joined Nike, there was no such thing as Nike Air. Right. And, then when, and then when we introduced Nike Air, Air in my early years, Nike Air wasn't visible like it is now. 
Right. It was actually, you know, technically hard to do. And so I was there for the launch of, uh, I was actually doing retail marketing around America for the launch of the first Air Max, as well as the Air Trainer SC and some other shoes that came out in this Air Pack, we called it. And uh, so I was there to watch technology develop over the years. But also, you know, competition was fierce. You know, mm -hmm. there was a time when Reebok completely toppled everybody by capturing the hearts and minds of women, which, you know, Nike was a very, you know, bro, you know, type of company at the time, very locker room-ish. And then Reebok came out with a, the freestyle and just changed the game and made, gave women a platform and started this conversation about sport and fashion maybe not being so far apart. Mm, okay. And, and let me, let me tap back into this for a second. The decision to short supply a sneaker, that's a decision. That's not, Oh, we weren't prepared. We didn't think they'd be, that's a, some, some hot shot made that decision somewhere. So, um, <laughs> It, it, it's it's this is what it was in order to get interest in something. Disney did it years later. Disney decided to say, if you don't buy the DVD of Aladdin right now, um, we're going to put it in the vault forever. So everybody made a mad rush to go out and buy it. My favorite story about supply and demand is Beanie Babies. That's why they had a higher price on the market. I mean, they, they were they were, before there was an eBay, there was a Beanie Babies frenzy in this country. It's the oldest trick in the book, supply and demand. People want things they can't have. But I know about supply and demand. And I know, I remember Beanie Babies, but I would have never concluded that that was a decision that someone made in advance. I would, I would assume they, they just underprepared, right? Well, that, that, that's probably the nucleus of any of these phenomenons is underprepare and not manufacturing enough, sure. But uh, it also can be used as a selling strategy. I'm sharing too much. And by the way, <laughs> no, what, not. what we would do is we would go and back to my delivering prescription drugs or delivering dry cleaning in Manhattan to you know, famous movie stars. Um, when I was in my first job at Nike, I traveled around the markets and I realized it was the people and that bought things that mattered, not the companies. The companies and boardrooms and conference rooms are full of questions. And the people in the streets have all the answers. So during the Jordan years, we spent a lot of time in some of the big metro cities, whether it's DC, New York, Philly, Baltimore. And we learned from the kids, maybe not what they, what, what they wanted, but we learned where their heads were at. And uh, I do remember we would take out an Air Jordan and say, listen, I'm gonna show you this, but you can't tell anybody because if you do, I'm going to lose my job. And it's like telling a kid, don't spill your milk. Of course, they're going to spill their milk. So they went and told everybody. And then on that certain date, kids are lining up. So it was called word of foot advertising. Wow. So, so first of all, you're not telling too much, okay? You're not naming names. You're not incriminating anybody. You're, share, you're mentoring us, right? And this is what we need to know. This is why you're here, my friend. And, and, and I appreciate it. I'll speak for everybody that hasn't seen this interview yet. We appreciate it in advance, okay? So, all right. So you, you move over to Reebok. Now, do you know the kid, the kid from the Bronx being a part of these things? Like I was, I was, I was making a comment to someone how the, the hoodie is a part of my culture. The hoodie is a part of my community. And, and it was developed in the 1930s in Rochester, New York. And I did some research on where the hoodies came from, right? To uh, keep the miners warm. Mm -hmm. But now it's 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 part of hip hop culture. It's, it's part of sports culture. And but it started somewhere. Right. It didn't start. It started decades before we embraced it. What you're talking about uh, this, you, you being a kid from the Bronx, the things you're talking about are are absorbed in our culture. Right. There are kids who are paying a thousand dollars for sneakers like you can when when sneakers go on sale and the. the special designs and limited editions there are there are people that live and die by by the brands you were part of the the development of 
that's if you ever wondered why would anybody would interview you, that's why someone would interview you because those are those moments you're telling us about are like seriously, Jordan's seriously running sneakers, seriously, boom. These are milestones in our culture. Yeah, but Kevin, you know, first of all, I was a small part. There's lots of people that are involved in these things. And second, you know, you can't just do it with anything. You know, there has to be a legend. There has to be a brand. There has to be a backstory. I do believe um, in, when Michael came into the NBA, um, he was not Air Jordan. Right. That, that was a marketing campaign that came out in, during the preseason when he wore black and red shoes that were outlawed by the NBA, which everybody knew were going to be outlawed. And to pay the $5,000 fine for Michael was the best marketing dollars you could ever spend. Um, but it was also the advent of MTV. It was the advent of ESPN. And those things really, I call it a confluence of, you know, Michael Jordan just didn't do this out of thin air, no pun intended. It, these other cultural and social expressions were happening at the same time. And it was a time when Carlos Santana wanted to learn how to play tennis and John McEnroe conveniently wanted to learn how to play guitar. So culture was starting to meld together. Music and sports was becoming one and the same. So a lot, and then it was also back when people actually watched television on a television set and actually watched commercials. And none of that exists in this day. So there's other forms of confluence going forward. Like with when I mentioned about Reebok, when you know they had their big hit with the freestyle and women found aerobics. It was an important time because there was a movie then called Nine to Five uh, with Dolly Parton, Jane Fonda and Lily Tomlin. And it was based on a true story, even though it was somewhat of a comedy of some women in Boston who felt that they were, um, you know, under the thumb of their boss. So they only thought the way that they could get the advancement they deserved would by publicly shaming him. And so women needed and still need their day and, and the, the idea of equal pay, et cetera. So the idea of the freestyle might seem like a great selling shoe in a variety of colors and everybody had 10 or 15 pair in their closet. But the reality of it is, is that it was based on social change at the time and, and it exploded because of that. Would it have been successful without these social um, expressions? Maybe, but would it have been legendary and his, historic like Michael is without uh, ESPN or MTV? I, I honestly don't believe so. Right, right. But just, well, you don't know, but I'm just old enough to remember everything you're talking about. Right. I'm just old enough to remember those moments and not, you know, I'm, I'm the kid from the project in the Bronx. I couldn't afford the Jordans. Right. Uh, uh, and my mother, you know, trying to keep me, you know, in style. We, we, we joke about it. All, everybody in my community joked about how they had the knockoff brands in the, you know, in the little discount stores and whatever. And the 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 swoosh was upside down, or the or there was an extra stripe on the Adidas, or something, you know, something crazy like that. But I remember these moments, and when you when you bring them up, even though you you say you're a small part, when you bring them up, you're you're triggering memories of my of my youth, of my childhood, of my you know of the things that were important to me and my friends growing up. So it it is more relevant than you you might want to admit. Right. It's more relevant to some of us than you might want to admit. Well, so I, maybe I, I my maybe my role, Kevin, as a historian is relevant. But my part in all this <laughs> is I, I, I'm no I'm just a kid from the Bronx and I had a small part in it. And I just had a great seat to watch some of these things. Yes. And, um, you know, and I'm forever grateful. Yes. So uh, kid from the Bronx, you was there a moment where you where you had an accomplishment? After you, after you hung up the cleats, was there a moment where you had an accomplishment that made you say, I did it? You know, it's interesting to this day, and uh, I'll show the difference in our age. When I was a kid, we had two choices, PF Flyers or U.S. Keds. And then if you had any prolific, you know, uh, sight into basketball, you, were, you could get a pair of cons. We didn't call them chucks back then. So, um, but anyway, I, when I had the, when I ran the equivalent of the 359, it was a 1500 meter race. I crossed the finish line and I was excited, of course, but I started thinking about the next week and I've never celebrated a moment or I thought about some place where I've made it and I've got it. I don't, I don't even think that's true. I think once you get there, um, I think you're giving up. 
I think you should always have this, this idea of aspiring, you know, beyond what anything you've ever accomplished. I, I also believe may, maybe people would disagree with me who know me. I believe that I was humbled by anything I accomplished. And also in business, as you climb and you get up, it's rare air up there, particularly when you're the president. I was the president uh, or CEO of three different companies, um, Merrill, Timberland and Asics. And when you're up there, it's lonely. Um, the air is thin and it's like being a baseball manager. You're hired to be fired. So uh, even though they may seem like accomplishments to other people, uh, they're, they're usually nothing to celebrate, at least for me. OK, so so speaking to somebody that hit that that high level of business, when you are the, the president, CEO of a, of a major corporation. You you get fired, then you take a break and then you start sending out resumes. Does a headhunter approach you or does somebody poach you? How, how does that work to go from head of one company to head of another? Yeah. So all of the above and um, the mentoring that I've done, you know, not just, uh, you know, in general, but also particularly at the city tutors, all of those things matter. You know, um, just because you get fired as a CEO for whatever the reasons may be, um, uh, unless they're egregious, um, you get fired, you're still the same quality person that they hired several years earlier. Nothing has changed. So, you know, so for other companies, you might be a better fit. Um, listen, I think uh, the one thing that I wanted to be careful of my whole career was to work on my reputation. And the best way to work on your reputation is make sure that you are confident in who you are serving, whether it's the, the consumers or who you are serving in your own company. I've, I've always wanted to be close to the young people in our company, mostly because that's where I feel comfortable. You know, I'd rather spend time with a bunch of young people telling me what I'm doing wrong than sit in uh, a conference room with a bunch of VPs who were telling me what I wanted to hear. So, um, you know, so you have to stay relevant, but you have to you have to make sure your integrities are at the highest level. You have to make sure that you could sleep at night, that you did not only the right thing, but you were thoughtful and kind along the way. This idea that you have to be terrible as a CEO, as a human being to be a CEO is just is, is hogwash. I think being a good guy, good guys can win. And then the, the other thing is, yeah, you do get poached. And that's an interesting game because, um, you know, the minute somebody starts talking to you, if the word gets out, it causes a lot of dilemmas. I, I mentioned earlier that I had, when I left Nike, they exercised my non-compete clause and I had to sit home for a year. Well, guess what? I had to sit home for another year and a half, three different times over my career. So for two and a half years of my career, I had to sit home with full pay and not work. And may, many people think that sounds great. It was excruciating. I'm a kid from the Bronx. I got dirt under my fingernails from way back when, and I still want to keep that dirt there. So I need to be working and clawing my way. And I never did it to build a career, Kevin. I did it to feed my kids. That was my motivation. If I could get a better job that could expand my horizons, not to mention my pay, I would do it to feed my kids and give them a good life. How many kids did you have? I like to say I have, I have four kids, but I like to say I have one of each. <laughs> I, I have a boy, a girl, a brat, and a pain in the ass. I can't <laughs> tell them apart. But uh, no, I have four kids. And I don't know what they heard at the dinner table, but three of the four work in the same industry. Two are at Adidas and one is a, a graphic artist at Band. So um, I'm glad that they can find happiness and success in this industry. Okay. They, did they grow up in the Bronx too or you were, you were different places that, at that so time? So we, we moved around uh, a lot, but um, uh, three of the kids were born in Portland, Oregon. And uh, uh, the youngest was born uh, just right outside of Washington, D.C. Uh, where did you meet the missus? At Nike. And... Um, oh. You know, and, uh, you know, so that was a long time ago and she had her career, too. But uh, the, the three kids, you know, were um, were not my three kids, but I never looked at it that way. I looked at them as they were my kids. I wanted to raise them and give them the good graces that I was privileged with. So and then, you know, we had one together who's the one at Vans. And uh, at what point, uh, you know, it, uh, for our viewers, our viewers know that the City Tutors is a volunteer tutoring and mentorship program. So it's basically volunteerism, altruism, not-for-profit, community service. At what point did you pivot? What made you pivot from the, the big bucks of the corporate world to the different bucks of the not-for-profit world? 
That's an interesting question. And, and I thought long and hard about this. Uh, I can recall I was the president and CEO of ASICS for uh, North and South America from 2015 to 2019. And I noticed in all of my world travels that when I went either to my, my apartment at night or I went to a hotel room at night, my reflection of the day seemed to be more around the young people that I met in my company or in the, in the marketplace or whatever, and, and their twinkle-eyed hope for the future. And uh, I was spending more time thinking about that than I was thinking about, you know, well, we hit our number or, you know, our profits are up or whatever. And, and I realized that when my career came to its close, um, I wanted to spend more time giving back. I, I can't recall too much help on my way up, although I have heroes and, and people that have, have been inspirational to me. And I just want to be that guy. So I, uh, I reached out uh, out of the blue during the pandemic to Gary Rivkin because uh, I read about uh, online this little blurb about the city tutors. And, uh, you know, he assigned me a young girl who uh, lives on Cedric Avenue, which if I stood at my apartment building on Claflin Avenue, I could throw a rock over the building and land on her house. I think there's something to be said with that. Um, and, uh, and here's a young girl that, um, who I, uh, I felt was a little lost and you needed not only direction, but she needed confidence and courage. And I think that's the mentoring part. And uh, I'm proud of her now because she just enrolled in an MBA um, um, course at, um, at, at uh, Lehman. So I'm real proud of her. So there's, it's for those people who contemplate tutoring or mentoring, um, there is a lot of gratification you get from it. But I, I think the, the biggest thing you get is not that there's a reward that it makes you feel good. I think what you get is that you understand that you can be selfless in this world and you can help other people just because you, you help other people, not because you want a reward. And I think that's what I get most out of it. Sometimes when you work in corporations, you know, the business is very transactional and it's really hard to find any type of gratification or beauty or reward out of that. But dealing with young people and seeing them help themselves. I, I've never helped her one minute of our time together. She helped herself. All I did was give her, you know, the tools to do it. But that's that's very helpful. <laughs> that's very helpful. Imagine I'm um, telling somebody, hey, uh, uh, this this wall is falling apart. Here's a nail. Uh, fix the wall. But you don't give them a hammer. Right. Mm -hmm. Imagine them trying to push it in with their hands. It's, they can they might do it one day, but it'll take forever. Right. Mm -hmm. So you 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 are being you are being very helpful. Where where do you think that? spirit came from where where was that in you was were your kids were your kids uh like did they all graduate and leave the house and now you were what where where did that trigger come from i i think you know uh, first of all i would probably take it all the way back to the bronx and as the oldest of five um i had an inherent responsibility to be that oldest and um i always felt guilty years later because when I focused on being a successful runner, it's a very uh, selfish lifestyle. And I don't know that I paid enough attention to my siblings and uh, I, I, I have strong relationships with them now, but I, I do have regrets about that. You know, but, but the other thing is too, is that um, you know, I found a sport and I, I don't enjoy running, I actually hate it. But running for me was, wasn't a means to itself, it was a means uh, to an end. And it, it helped me. I needed to get out of the Bronx. The Bronx in the late 70s was not cool. Sorry. You know, the Bronx is burning, says Howard Cosell. Um, I needed to get out. I needed to not only get out of the Bronx, I needed to find myself like a penguin does so I can bring, find the food and bring it back home. That's what the penguin does. It wanders away for six months, gathers the food and brings it back to the family. So I think that sense of, uh, you know, uh, wanting to give back to my siblings. Well, now they're all grown and successful with kids and grandkids of their own. I, I thought the best way to do it is go back to the Bronx and give it to like Natalie Rodriguez, you know, an immigrant family from the Dominican, you know, and uh, I think that there's a lot of metaphor and parallels with that, if you understand, Kevin. Okay. Yeah, no, no, I absolutely, I absolutely understand. Okay. So um, all of that being said, I want to, I can, I can, I can pivot and dig into your siblings and, and, you know, add another half hour, but you, you've been gracious enough to give me, you know, this much time and I, I value that and I really appreciate that. So I'm not going to go down that road.
But I will say, I will ask you this. Uh, what is the best advice you've ever been given? And what is the best advice that you can offer to your younger self or to young people? When I lived in Gainesville, Florida, I had the privilege of getting to know and be friendly with uh, the founder of Gatorade, Dr. Cade. And before I moved from Florida, after four years with Nike to Portland, Oregon, you know, to work for Nike, he said, I want to give you, I want to tell you a story and I want it to be, you know, guide you in your, in your future. So he told me a story in the late stages of developing Gatorade he, that he, um, he would take samples of it down to the Florida uh, football teams, University of Florida football teams practice. And before the practice, he had uh, several players taste it and uh, or drink it. And one lineman spit it out and he goes, oh, my God, this tastes like piss. And Dr. Cade said, good, we're on the right track. And what I learned later, and this is the piece of advice, he could have listened to all of that and gone back to the drawing board and reinvented Gatorade, but he didn't. He stuck with his guns because he knew that Gatorade was designed to be palatable after you were depleted, not before practice. So after your practice. So he, it basically his advice was when, you, when something in your gut and your heart are, are, are really feel strongly about something, go with your instinct. And uh, education is great, but intelligence and smarts are two different things. The other piece of advice I would give everybody out there is to follow your dreams. I'm, I'm a, a humbled kid that I had a dream come true and it gave me just like you learned, wanted to learn how to kick and it got you a black belt. I wanted to learn how to follow a dream and it got me a career. And the other one is be true to your school. Stay close to where you came from. Never, ever, ever forget where you came from. Mm. Mm. That, that I'm going to, I'm going to borrow that as I, as I um, work with my school, as I work with my, uh, my college, I, I'm having a, a, a hurdle that I have to overcome dealing with the alumni association and getting the alumni to come back. Uh, I'm, I'm hoping to be the poster child, the ambassador of that movement and say, see, I'm back. Why don't y'all come back? But it's really it's really a chore because it's been so a lot of a lot of people's experiences have been so transactional. They figure they they paid their tuition. They got their degree. The deal, you know, thank you you know, see you when I see you, but not come back and pay it forward. So uh, I'm definitely going to be borrowing that one. When you think, corner. Kevin, when you think of the city tutors, one of the things I love about it is that the kids or even the adults that we're tutoring and mentoring now, it'll come full circle. They're going to come back and be the tutors and mentors for the next generation. I, 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 I glean that. I've been, I've been with the city tutors uh, for what, September 1st. I started September 1st and it's, you know, not even November yet. So it's less than two months, but I'm really impressed by what I'm seeing. Uh, 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 I'm having, I have fun every day. I learn something new every day. I, 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 I really enjoy the people. I enjoy meeting people like you. And, um, you know, so I'm glad I stumbled across it and, you know, I, I, I hope we're making the impact that you are, you know, that you're putting out into the universe. Is there anything that, we, we spoke for almost 50 minutes now. I asked you a lot of questions. You gave me a lot of answers. Is there anything that we missed? Is there anything that you, that you want to share with us or, or in, inform us about that we did not cover yet? I think we could probably talk. I feel so comfortable with you, Kevin. I could probably talk to you for hours and hours, uh -huh. days upon days. No, I, I'd like to leave it at that. I'd like that to be something that just settles in, you know, with our listeners and, and it settles in for me too. It's very revealing some of the things I had to mention. And, um, you know, so it's, it, it's important that I think we keep it in its right place. Plus it gives us the opportunity um, to have this chat again sometime. Ah, absolutely. Absolutely. I, I, I'm, I'm with that. I si signed me up for that. So that being said, Listen, I really appreciate you. But, oh, you know what? I want you to clarify. So just full disclosure, you are affiliated. You started out as a mentor for City Tutors, and now you, you, have, you have a different role. What is that different role with City Tutors? Yeah, I was uh, honored when Gary Rivkin asked me to join the board. And uh, so I'm on the board of directors. I, um, 
I, I'm humbled by that role for sure. I work with several other people. We all bring different skill sets to help Gary, you know, you know, realize his vision. And, um, you know, it's a, it's a fantastic group of people, but, um, you know, there's, uh, there, I mean, Tom Kendall, I mean, there, there's certain guys that one guy's the finance guy. We have a guy, Todd Hawk, who's all about, you know, startups and, and technology and all that, which helps Michael Chin quite a bit. Then, you know, we have Alex Cohen, who's a lawyer, which we need. And so we, we have that, we have a board that, um, First of all, is just wants to see Gary and his mission become successful. But we also have a board that wants to make sure that we're building an infrastructure for this organization. Hence, you're joining us. That was that was a big decision for us, and uh, we're glad that you're here. And that, and the added dimension that you bring to the city tutors. But yeah, I'm on the board, and I'm I, I'm proud of it. And if I were on an elevator at the third floor and going down to the first floor, and somebody said, "So what do you do?" I would say, "I'm on the board of the city tutors." Before I'd say anything else. There you go. There you go. Absolutely. And um, coming from a man as well accomplished as yourself, that that's a that's a honorable statement. I appreciate it.